Thank you very much. Uh, please enjoy your lunch, and while you are eating, one ear towards me is sufficient, I think. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Professor Recep, already announced the topic. We may take it in a general sense also, uh, uh, science and religion, which is uh, a significant debate nowadays. There are many uh, debates going on. Uh, I will try to provide perhaps an, ans an answer for this from my book, uh, which uh, he has shown it to you. Now, uh, usually this uh, science religion is understood in the sense that one is excluding the other. Is that so? Is that the case or not? One answer from one of the uh, well-known uh, Muslim uh, philosophers and scientists also uh, that uh, lived uh, in the, uh, towards the end of the 13th century, Averuiz, known in Latin, uh, Ibn Rushd in Arabic. He said that no true statement of religion can contradict any statement of science. In other words, truth, as represented by religion, cannot contradict wisdom which is represented by science and philosophy. And he further argued that divine law combines revelation with reason. And revelation, of course, is represented by the religion. It is to be understood on the basis of causes, means, and purposes. The revelation is completed by the element of reason. And reason is completed by the element of revelation, which is a very good explanation, in fact. If we take this uh, as uh, he proposed it, we need to say a few things about science today. Unfortunately, science, as it was conceived at that time, was a bit different. And today, they interpret it differently especially one current of thought developed in the West known as positivism, uh, totally changed uh, the concept of science from its traditional sense. So we need to provide a definition, a definition which uh, offers a solution also for the uh, science religion debate. But this is the problem actually. I will give some examples. The uh, well-known physicist Ernest Rutherford, also Nobel laureate, once asked, what is science? He replied, science is what scientists do. <laughs> it tells us something, but doesn't explain anything about the nature of science and scientific knowledge and he refers to the activity. You know, if we try to define uh, an object, it will be easy to define it because it's an object, it's a being. But if we try to define something which is connected to human activity also, then it becomes very difficult. And science is something like that. It is something that results as a res that comes as a result of human activities, the activities of the scientists. Therefore, it is very difficult. There is another Muslim, uh, contemporary Muslim uh, intellectual, Samir Okasha. He gives a definition. He says, science is just the attempt to understand, explain, and predict the world we live in. Again, let's choose another philosopher. I chose these uh, philosophers and scientists because they refer very uh, directly to the definition of the science. That is why Alex Rosenberg, in his book, Philosophy of Science, 
he defines, he tries to explain it. Maybe, I don't know if this can be taken as a definition or not, but this is his explanation. The history of science from the Greeks to the present is the history of one compartment of philosophy after another, breaking away from philosophy and emerging as a separate discipline. We may add each called a science with a specific name, leaving behind unsolved problems to philosophy. It's a good description, but with one problem. The problem is that he says, if there is an unsolved issue, a problem in science, that is left for philosophy to solve, which is not correct. We know that uh, all sciences are repositories of unsolved problems. So, this uh, gives, a, you know, a, again, le leaves us in a problematic situation. Uh, what I would like to offer here, you know, because of uh, these problematic approaches, then uh, in the West, uh, an attitude was developed, perhaps as a result of the scientific revolution. Scientific revolution. Uh, starting from Galileo and perhaps coming all the way to Immanuel Kant and uh, of course Newton, Newtonian physics, development of that, uh, that uh, only uh, those disciplines that study nature are considered as sciences. The rest are referred to as disciplines or with some other names. Sometimes they call social sciences, but even in that case, they are not so serious when they apply the term science to those other disciplines, namely disciplines studying uh, humans, society, history, and so on. So as a result, anything that is not uh, included in the classification of these sciences, sometimes they refer to them as positive sciences, they are excluded. But this also excludes religion. Religion as giving uh, the true knowledge about some kind of reality. Now, this attitude is uh, described by those who are concerned about the results of this ideology as scientism, scientism. And perhaps the, uh, one of the uh, philosophers and scientists who is defending this ardently in the West is Richard Dawkins. I am sure you have, if you have not read his book, you have seen or heard The God Delusion. And then there is uh, Rupert Sheldrake. He wrote a refutation to that by the name Science Delusion. Science delusion. And this is what he said. He said uh, in his rejection of modern science, he outlines the doctrine of what we call scientism as 10 dogmas of modern science. 10 dogmas. Although science does not defend dogmas, yet it includes, he says. Number one, the universe is mechanical. And therefore, it includes in itself the rules of running itself, like a clock. Of course, Newton used this uh, analogy, but Newton said that there is God who created the clock and also rewinds it continuously. So there is a connection still between God and the universe. But modern science totally excludes this idea. Number two, everything in the universe is unconscious, except human beings. Number three, total amount of energy and matter is always the same. Number four, nature has no purpose. These are perhaps detrimental to religion. Number five, the laws of nature are fixed. Number six, biological inheritance is material. DNA and genetics, referring to that. Number seven, all knowledge is stored in the brain. Therefore, mind is just another term for brain. Number eight, mental activity is brain activity. 
Number nine, psychic phenomena are illusory. Number ten, only mechanistic medicine works, <clears throat> referring perhaps to all fields of sciences. How should we approach science in that case to resolve all these issues? This is what I proposed. In my work, I said what I should do since I am well versed in at least three traditions, namely the Greek, ancient Greek scientific tradition and Islamic scientific tradition. And also I am trained in Western scientific tradition. I would like to study the history of these traditions and see how they conceive science in the past. What kind of characteristics I can derive from their explanation or from their understanding I came up with this conclusion that whatever they call science includes four main characteristics. Number one, subject matter. That a science must have a subject matter, but this subject matter is defined, well defined, and limited to each science. And number two, they developed a specific method uh, that works for that specific subject matter. So each science has a method to study that subject. In other words, they also develop a methodology. Number three, as a result of that study, they reach the idea of theories. They produce some theories. These three ideas you can see very clearly in Aristotle's works, very clearly. Sometimes he specifically refers to these. When he tries to define physics, for example, or metaphysics again, and he wants to identify very clearly the subject matter. And he tells the methodology. And he also tells us what previous scientists and philosophers said about that specific subject matter, which constitutes the body of no theories in that science. But he, ex he didn't mention the fourth one. The fourth one, for the first time, was proposed by Al-Ghazali, a well-known Muslim philosopher, lived in the 11th century. He died in 1111. His proposal was this. He said a science, you know, after some, uh, suppose we can even say after some centuries of studying, should be able to prove some of its theories. If the science is not able to prove some of its theories, that means it cannot produce knowledge. And therefore, there will no scientific discovery will be possible in that specific discipline. And he, is there such a science? He said, yes, there is one. It is metaphysics. And therefore, metaphysics is not a science, he said. Uh, this is very interesting. You know, this very idea was defended by Immanuel Kant in the, uh, towards the end of the 18th century in his famous work, Critique of Pure Reason. So that is why I included that also in my uh, characteristics of sciences. So if we, that, as you know, when we try to define something, we try to use these characteristics. So that means in our definition of science, we should include these characteristics. But there is one more thing that I noticed. Sciences produce knowledge but doesn't leave the knowledge, you know, in a chaotic order. It orders the uh, knowledge, puts into an order. Uh, as a result of that order, these characteristics are put together. And as you know, usually when something is in totality, we would like to refer to it by a name. That name represents the concept of that science. Usually, the name of the science is picked up from its subject matter. If we, uh, again, return to Aristotle, he calls physics, today we call it physics, but as you know, literally, in the ancient Greek, it means nature, right? From phusis, it is derived from that idea. And in fact, even in Islamic tradition, it is called tabi'iyat, again, it refers to nature. So it is chosen from the subject matter. So, but this uh, argumentation does not belong to a science as a characteristics. It belongs to us because otherwise our mind will not be able 
to capture that body of knowledge in unity. So what gives a unity to it is the concept of the science. And this I call scientific consciousness. So sciences emerge as a result of this scientific consciousness. It is possible for a civilization to have all other activities, namely subject matter, theories with methodology and so on, but if they don't give a name to it, the body of knowledge is, does not hold together. After a century or so, it disintegrates. It loses, it, it is not continuous anymore. History of science should be continuous. Otherwise, it will not turn into a scientific tradition and it will not be able to sustain itself. I can give example from ancient Egyptian civilization. There are scientific activities, but they did not give names to them. They utilized them as technology. As a result, it did not continue. It didn't lead to a scientific tradition. So, when we consider all of these, then how can we define a science? Number one, we use those four characteristics. Number two, they should lead to a name after a certain process, which includes the scientific tradition also. So when we consider this, I come up with this definition of science. Science is an organized body of knowledge named through scientific consciousness as a result of investigating a well-defined subject matter with a certain methodology leading to accumulation of theories and scientific knowledge. I think this will solve many of our problems. On the other hand, there is one uh, issue also that we should discuss. It is uh, the epistemology of science. Namely, when scientists, when they are engaged in their scientific activities, what kind of frameworks in their mind they are using, they are utilizing. I give this analogy. I say that scientific activity resembles quite well uh, a painting. A scientist, in a sense, is a painter. So a painter, when he or she wants to paint a beautiful scenery, first chooses a place for himself, herself. Because the painter wants to see what perspective best describes that scenery. So the place where he or she stands represents his perspective. Therefore, there is a perspective in that, in that case. Number two, after the perspective, there is a canvas, and the painter should try to uh, draw a frame for himself, herself, so that he or she can transfer it to his or her canvas. So that means must the painter must also draw a framework. After that, the painter can start painting. But even when he or she starts painting, the painter will be using the, his understanding of uh, painting, art, beauty, color, light, etc. So all these are developed in the mind of the painter. I'm saying that a scientist is also the same. A scientist has a perspective, but of course his perspective is not like the perspective of the painter, namely it's not something physical, but it develops in his mind as a result of his scientific training that he gets. But this is the larger perspective, and that is his her worldview. So a scientist cannot overcome his her worldview uh, in his scientific activities. He must utilize it, otherwise his mind will not be able to work, utilize the ideas. Now, the second thing is the framework. That framework is provided by the scientific tradition, the scientific tradition, which he gets through, again, his scientific training. And the third one is in his specific area, whatever his specialty is, he will utilize. If he's physicist, he will utilize the physics framework, in other words. So when we consider this, then we can say that he is utilizing all these frameworks in his activities. If we try to apply this to Islamic worldview, 
uh, Islamic scientific tradition, we say that a Muslim uh, scientist is utilizing Islamic worldview and Islamic scientific tradition and whatever physics or uh, chemistry or philosophy, whatever the subject is, will be utilizing that. Now, in this framework, some may object, how can such a person cooperate with someone coming from a different worldview, say from a Western scientific tradition? In the specific areas, they can cooperate, namely in physics, in specific uh, place, uh, sciences. In physics, uh, problems of philosophy, problems of chemistry, mathematics, and so on, this the cooperation is possible. But when it comes to interpreting those findings, they will be uh, differing from each other. This is one thing. The second thing is that if we pay attention to our time, you know, I developed this from historical analysis. Usually, when I talk about this, people say that, look, you know, from, you go to Japan, they work in sciences, and you go to US, there are Turks, J Japanese, Chinese. If you come here, again, they are working together. How is that possible? I think we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't forget the fact that today, because of globalization, science and scientific activity uh, has also become a global activity. So as, as you can see, we are in Turkey, but I'm speaking in, in English. So there is a global language of science also. So this confuses us. We think that this, this, this is the case. It has always been in history also, which is not the case. But it gives us an, an idea that maybe in future, there will not be any more local uh, traditions, local traditions. So people will be sharing this. How, what should we do in that case locally? What we can do is what we have been doing here. I can tell you what I learned from my own tradition so that we can integrate it with the global tradition and cooperate further. And not only that, perhaps we can cooperate also on larger frameworks also. This we have to do it because we cannot reverse the history anymore. You cannot say, oh no, I want to do scientific activity in my own tradition, this is, this is not going to be possible as far as I can see it. But when we look at the truth in this way, let me tell you the values of Islamic scientific tradition that resulted as an activity in the past, so that we can share this also. Uh, one minute left, thank you very much. I, uh, I think I'll finish in one minute. So the characteristics of Islamic scientific tradition. Number one, true knowledge is but with God. And he reveals knowledge to the prophets. Now, the characteristics of this revealed knowledge, now, of course, this is totally local, local and belongs to Islamic scientific tradition um, and perhaps to some Abrahamic traditions also can share this, this, the, these characteristics. Now, the purpose of this revealed knowledge is guidance. And the method of guidance is conveying. And it uses the light of the heart, addresses the feelings more. And its main principle is renewal, renewal. And its language addresses the mind and through the heart. It is light and thus it enlightens. It addresses humans at all levels and it is granted by divine grace. These are the main characteristics. So this leads to hierarchy of knowledge, which is neglected today very much. Hierarchy of knowledge, with maratib, in other words. The, the highest level of knowledge is revealed knowledge. Then comes knowledge derived from the revealed knowledge and then comes scientific knowledge. So scientific knowledge needs the light of the revealed knowledge. Otherwise, it can lead to destruction. This is the uh, result of the scientism. And then comes intellectual knowledge and the common knowledge that widely spread throughout the whole society. So thank you very much for listening for, to me.